Okay, class, welcome to chapter two of molecular biology, where we'll focus on uh, the chemical foundations of molecular biology. So in the chemistry of life, there are really four overarching concepts uh, that enable life. Uh, the first is this molecular complementarity, and this molecular complementarity enables proteins with complementary shapes and chemical properties to form bio, uh, biomolecular interactions. So this is the idea that um, the shape of a protein, in this case here, uh, with the use of these chemical interactions and bonds forming, can interact with another protein or with a ligand. Uh, the second is that small molecular building blocks fold, form larger cellular structures and polymers. Um, and this is not uh, more prevalent than anything um, but DNA. So we have these small uh, nucleic acids and they are linked together to form a macromolecule through this polymerization process. And a nucleotide by itself doesn't give information, but through this polymerization process in forming DNA, we can preserve this information in the genetic code. But this isn't only specific to DNA. Um, for example, the polymerization and chaining of amino acids forms proteins. Um, the chaining of phospholipids form uh, the membrane, etc. Um, another concept that is important to uh, the uh, chemical reactions within the cell is that chemical reactions are reversible. So KEQ is the equilibrium rate. Um, and it is a relationship between the forward and reverse uh, reaction rates uh, or reaction rate constants for that matter of a chemical reaction. And so this reflects the relative amount of products and reactants at an equilibrium state within the cell. Um, and then lastly, another important uh, concept is that energy driving many of these cellular and molecular activities uh, within the cell is derived from hydrolysis. And this is usually hydrolysis of these high energy uh, phosphoanhydride bonds that are indicated here uh, within ATP. So ATP is the main storage molecule of energy within the cell. And by breaking these bonds between uh, the beta and the gamma phosphates in the ATP molecule, uh, we release a, trend, a tremendous amount of energy and are able to uh, power these reactions within the cell. So briefly here we have kind of a reminder from your chemistry classes of uh, covalent bonds and non-covalent bonds. Um, so in mo uh, for molecules we have hydrophilic, hydrophobic, and amphipathic uh, interactions. Covalent bonds are, are where there's a shared electron pair arranged uh, in these specific geometries, such as, stereo, uh, such as stereoisomers around uh, asymmetric carbons, and unequal electron sharing yields polar covalent bonds with partial charges. Um, more stable than these are more stable than the weaker non-covalent bonds. Um, and four types of bio, uh, biological non-covalent bonds are ionic bonds, hydrogen bonds, van der Waals interactions, and hydrophobic effect interactions. Um, and then lastly, molecular complementarity is the fit between molecule shapes, charges, and other physical properties. So this is a kind of a uh, two molecules fitting together uh, uh, theory. A brief refresher on covalent bonds. Um, this is the idea that these bonds form by sharing of electrons. And so uh, in this uh, carbon molecule here, in the outermost layer, we have a single electron. Um, and in these hydrogen atoms, we also have a single electron, but both of those orbits want to have at least two electrons. And so at this point, the, elect or the hydrogen and the carbon will come and uh, share an electron between both of those orbits. So the hydrogen, as you can see here, it's kind of like a Venn diagram. The hydrogen now has two in that orbit. The carbon now has two in this uh, specific orbit. However, in its outer shell, it wants eight, so it will bind with four different hydrogens. So you can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in carbon, and then each hydrogen will have two in its innermost shell, which it is uh, looking to fill. 
um, and thus all of the interactions are that, or all of the uh, the shells are uh, full up and are not looking to add more electrons. And so by sharing, they've all reached this optimal level of uh, fulfilling their electron shells. So the rule of thumb in covalent bond formation is that when these bonds form, they want to be positioned the furthest away from one another. So in our example of formaldehyde here, where we have a single double bond to oxygen and then two single bonds to hydrogen, we can see that the three atoms that are covalently bound to carbon, oxygen and the two hydrogens, are all about 120 degrees away from each other. And this is the position that places them the furthest away from one, an one another. And it forms this kind of planar, uh, almost 2D structure. Now, in an example of methane, where one carbon is bound to four hydrogens, as we have here in the bottom, the same thing is true, except in this conformation, since there's four bonds, a tetrahedron is the shape that puts the hydrogens the furthest away from one another. And this is at 109.5 degrees between all of these, uh, there's one in the back here, all of these uh, attached hydrogens. So if you've taken organic, you've probably had this beaten into your head, but for those of you that may have not taken it or it's been a long time, uh, we're gonna talk briefly about stereoisomers. So the tetrahedral binding geometry of a carbon bound to four dissimilar atoms here um, is asymmetrical and can be arranged in three dimensional space in two different ways, uh, producing molecules that are mirror images of one another. Um, so it's kind of like your left and right hand, right? Mirror images, but they're uh, in two different uh, stereo conformations. Um, many molecules and cells, uh, such as amino acids and sugars, contain at least one asymmetric carbon atom. Um, although, and so here uh, we have uh, an example of a carbon uh, atom where we have the L isomer and the D isomer, as you can see, they're mirror images of one another based on their, their shape, um, not necessarily the conformation, but the actual shape of the structure. Um, and then although the L and D uh, stereoisomers of amino acids are chemically identical, only the L amino acid are found in proteins. Um, and so um, for those of you going into the uh, medical field after uh, you graduate, uh, these drug stereoisomers have different properties and potencies um, and different effects. Um, so Darwin is a pain reliever, uh, but it's stereoisomer, uh, not a Novarad, um, which is actually Darwin spelled backwards, funny uh, pharmaceutical joke, I guess, uh, is a cough suppressant. Um, so Novarad is a cough suppressant. Um, and Davron or Darwin, sorry, is a pain reliever. So they, they are the same chemical structure. They just have our different stereochemistry. So their structure is just slightly different or they're mirrored. Um, and one has an effect as a pain reliever and one has effective, uh, effect of a cough suppressant. And then um, for ketamine, one stereoisomer is an anesthetic. Um, so obviously ketamine you take for pain relief, et cetera. Um, but the other stereoisomer of ketamine causes hallucinations. Um, so obviously if you're in hospital, you don't want that stereoisomer. Um, some of you might be thinking, how do I get my hands on that for a party? Um, that's neither here nor there. Um, but yeah, so we'll avoid the hallucination ones and we want the anesthetic version of uh, ketamine. Let's look at the binding properties of the atoms that are most abundant in uh, biomolecules. And hydrogen uh, is obviously the most basic uh, atom and it has a single electron to share and it forms only one covalent bond, which we'll point here. Uh, oxygen usually forms two covalent bonds, but has two additional pairs of electrons that can participate in non-covalent interactions. Um, so as you can see here, it forms two bonds, but it still has two sets of electrons that can um, interact uh, outside of those uh, covalent bonds. Uh, sulfur has up to six electrons to share and also forms uh, two covalent bonds uh, in hydrogen sulfide, uh, but can accommodate six 
covalent bonds, as in sulfuric acid. Um, and it's sulfate, uh, as well as its sulfate derivatives. Uh, nitrogen has five electrons to share. So these are all the number of electrons to share are indicated on the left here. Um, and in ammonia, the nitrogen atoms form three covalent bonds, like over there. Um, and the pair of electrons around the atom are not involved that are not involved in covalent bonds can take part in non-covalent interactions. So generally, whenever there's uh, excess electrons, um, they are able to be bound to a biomolecule, but those extra electrons can then um, participate in non-covalent interactions. Um, phosphorus uh, has five electrons to share, right over there. Um, and it's commonly, it commonly forms uh, five covalent bonds, as we see over here, one double bond and three uh, single bonds. Um, and this is what forms the backbone of nucleic acids, obviously the phosphorus um, making phosphoric acid. Um, and then lastly, we have carbon, which is obviously uh, kind of the, the heavy lifter in biomolecules. Um, and this has four electrons to share and it forms four covalent bonds. So a quick review over the functional groups uh, found in biomolecules. So these are um, common covalent linkage, uh, linkages and um, they confer distinct chemical properties to the molecules which they're a part. So an OH attached by a single bond is a hydroxyl or an alcohol group. Um, a O, double bonded O, with a R means just a chain of something else. Um, that is an um, acyl group or a, a triacylglycerol. Um, a carbonyl group is where you have a double bonded O, and these would be carbons on the other side. This R is uh, a side chain, it can be an alcohol, etc., a different functional group. Um, a carboxyl group is where you have a double bonded oxygen and a single bonded oxygen um, that is has an unfulfilled uh, um, electron that is looking to make a bond. Um, a sulfhydryl group is a sulfur and a hydrogen uh, at the end of a carbon chain. An amino group is a uh, amino, or NH2, or an NH3 plus. Um, a phosphate group is a phosphorus with a double bonded oxygen as well as three single bonded oxygens around it. And a pyrophosphatase is kind of two phosphates linked together. Um, and then linkages within the center of a, uh, a carbon chain, there's an ester group uh, which is a carbon with an oxygen in between the two carbons, as well as a double bond carbon on one of them, or a double bond oxygen into a carbon on one of them. Um, an ether group is the same thing, but minus the double bond oxygen. And then lastly, we have a mead group, which is behind uh, my picture here, and that is a nitrogen um, linked to a carbon with a double bond oxygen. So um, you probably have learned of these in chemistry, but we're just doing a quick refresher. So briefly, um, the amount of energy required to form and released when breaking covalent or different bonds, non-covalent and covalent bonds, uh, depends on the type of bond. So uh, low en or low energy bonds, such as uh, bonds formed by thermal energy, van der Waals interactions, and hydrogen bonds. Um, only produce uh, up to about 2.5 kilocal per mole, um, so relatively uh, weak amounts of energy, and thus they're pretty easy to break. Um, however, covalent bonds are much stronger, and you have things like the hydrolysis of ATP, which we said is the main energy forming um, uh, reaction within the cell, um, as well as the energy required to break carbon, um, which is quite higher. And so um, to note from this is that these high energy um, 
uh, phosphohydrate bonds and ATP that are used to power these cellular interactions, even though they're less um, than the higher carbon-carbon and carbon double bonds to carbon bonds, um, it's still the main driver of the cell. However, these bonds can also be used within the cell for energy production. And so um, when it's possible to generate or regenerate ATP or fix those phosphorohydrate bonds by breaking down these carbon-carbon bonds. And that's where the uh, metabolism of carbohydrates and fats via glycolysis uh, occur and uh, will release more energy to replenish ATP. Let's look at electrostatic interactions. Um, and so in this case, we're gonna use uh, sodium chloride or salt. So instead of sharing electrons, a cation, such as sodium, um, it becomes positively charged by donating an electron to an anion that is negatively charged. Um, and so salt in its solid form uh, forms these crystals where cations and anions form this uh, neatly ordered array in which the positive and negative charges kind of counterbalance each other. So they're kind of positioned in this perfect way to fulfill uh, the desires of these negative and positively charged uh, cations and anions. But then when you put salt in the water, as you know, it dissolves, it disappears. And so it dissolves these ion crystals by forming electrostatic interactions between the ion charges. Uh, so the cation and the anion um, and water. So the water will come and form this hydration shell around each cation and anion. Um, and then the energy released uh, information of these or these ion hydration shells um, is greater than the lattice energy that stabilizes the crystals. So it's more desirable uh, for this these hydrogen shells to form than for salt to remain in this uh, crystal matrix. So water can form these hydrogen bonds with itself and many other complexes. Um, for example, we have uh, in liquid form, uh, water forming hydrogen bonds with other water uh, molecules. Um, but it can also uh, form hydrogen bonds with alcohols and amines, um, which solubilize the compound. So if you are to add uh, alcohol to water, with if you look at beer or any spirit that you may drink, or uh, ethanol in the lab, you'll notice that the alcohol is solubilized. It doesn't settle out because these hydrogen bonds keep it in solute, the alcohol in solution. Um, the peptide groups um, and ester groups, which are present in many bio, um, bio molecules, uh, form hydrogen bonds with water as well. And um, this also keeps them soluble in water. So uh, amines, peptides, and esters are all uh, form these hydrogen bonds and thus soluble in water. So van der Waals interactions are very weak, about one kilocal per mole uh, interaction, um, and that's slightly higher than thermal energy, so it's one of the weaker um, attractive forces. And uh, these are nonspecific uh, attractive forces between atoms that are in close in, uh, that are close enough for electrons of one atom to overlap and uh, perturb or interact with electrons of another atom without being shared. So it's kind of this, instead of sharing, they're close enough to have kind of an attraction to one another, but not enough where uh, compared to actual sharing atoms in an electron cloud. So hydrophobic interactions are when a polar substance such as water interacts with a nonpolar substance uh, in solution. And so here we have this nonpolar substance that is this kind of golden egg here. And the water, because it's not polar, is unable to form those hydrogen bonds uh, with this substance. And so what they do is they form these cages of water molecules uh, around the nonpolar molecule that is in solution. Um, and they're, uh, they're more ordered and therefore more energetic or more energetically unfavorable than water molecules that are in the surrounding bulk liquid. So if there's an increase in entropy or energy in the system, 
Um, this drives these nonpolar molecule uh, ag uh, aggregates, which will reduce the number of uh, unfavorable highly ordered cages and increase disordered water. So what that is saying is that um, these, in order to reduce the number of cages, because the cages are unfavorable compared to the water solution around, they will kind of aggregate all these nonpolar bodies together. And so that's where you see uh, things falling out of solution um, because there is, the water wants to form as little of these cages as possible. And one way of doing that is to put all the non-soluble components together so you can form a smaller number of these uh, water cages or a smaller sized water cage and let those other water molecules be free to associate with the liquid around it. Um, but anyways, these, uh, I'm losing my train of thought, uh, these nonpolar um, hydrophobic effects are present in the fatty acid interactions that are uh, the core of the membrane structure, so the, uh, bi the lipid bilayer. So molecular uh, complementarity permits tight protein bonding via multiple non-covalent interactions. And so um, this is kind of the idea that uh, the shape of two proteins interacting, if they're very uh, complementary to one another, will allow for more of these non-covalent bonds or interactions to occur, and thus a stronger bond between them. So as we see uh, the stable complex here on the left, uh, we see protein A and protein B have shapes that complement one another. So where these ridges on protein A are will fit into protein B, and where the ridges on protein B are will fit into protein A. And this close proximity will allow for many more of these bonds to form um, and these interactions between positively and negatively charged regions um, then if we were to compare it to a protein that is not complementary to one another, um, such as these on the uh, right-hand side here, while there's a little bit of complementary uh, shape here, for the most part, we have negatively charged ions on both sides that are going to repel one another away from each other, and it just doesn't fit as well. And this is important for protein-protein uh, interaction because if you're a protein, you want to make sure that your specific binding partner is all that is coming to bind you. You don't want random stranger proteins running around and taking up your active site binding domain um, if it's not going to lead to any sort of uh, chemical, uh, chemical reaction that's beneficial to the cell. So thus, this molecular complementarity is very important for making one protein specific to another or to a specific ligand, etc. Let's move a little bit away from chemistry and a little more into uh, the molecular biology aspect of this course um, and talk a little bit about the chemical building blocks of the cell. So we have macromolecule polymers, um, which are made up of these monomer subunits. And so for example, proteins are made up of amino acids, nucleic acids are made up of nucleotides, and polysaccharides are made up of monosaccharides, polysaccharides being uh, sugars. So in proteins, uh, there's differences in size, shape, charge, hydrophobicity, uh, and reactivity. Um, and this is all based on those 20 amino acids, the 20 common amino acids, um, and the side chains that determine these properties. <clears throat> With nucleic acids, um, we have purines, which are uh, A and G, and pyrimidines, which are C and T um, in DNA. And then U, um, uracil is also a pyrimidine in RNA. And those are the uh, monomeric subunits that make up DNA and RNA. So polysaccharides, we have hexoses, such as glucose, um, that are linked by uh, two types of bonds. Um, and then also in membranes, um, we have the amphipathic uh, phospholipids, and they have saturated or unsaturated tails associated with non uh, associated non-covalently 
to form bilayer membrane structure. So uh, these phospholipids have nonpolar uh, and polar heads. So the polar heads wanting to form these polar bonds will be uh, uh, hydrophilic, so they'll be on the outside. The nonpolar tails will be seg uh, segregated to the inside, and that's because the water uh, is polar and it wants to only associate with the heads, and thus the tails get oriented inside to protect them from the water. So these uh, major types of biological molecules that we talked about, uh, the peptides, nucleic acids, and polysaccharides, um, they will assemble by these covalent polymerization reactions where uh, we call the dehydration reaction, where this, these um, hydroxyl and hydrogen will bond and move off to form a water molecule. And the result then is this polymerized polypeptide chain. And this process is the same for both uh, nucleotides, where you can see there is a hydroxyl group and a hydrogen, and a hydroxyl group and a hydrogen that will also allow them to polymerize and form these longer chains. Now, in the case of phospholipids, as I said in the previous slide, we have this polar group at the top, these polar heads, and then these hydrophobic fatty acyl tails. And so if there's a bunch of water on the outside here, which in the cellular environment is the case, then all the polar heads, because water is polar, uh, you've probably heard like dissolves like or whatnot in class. So polar wants to be with other polar molecules. So the heads want to be all by the water and the tails want to be away from the water. So the tails will all segregate into the middle here or congregate in the middle and the heads will be on the outside and thus they're both happy right because all the heads are experiencing water all the tails are not experiencing water and thus we have this formation of a phospholipid bilayer and that's why it's important that it's a bilayer because if it was a phospholipid single layer then those tails would have to be exposed to water which is undesirable so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, um, but this is good for your knowledge. Um, if you're taking biochemistry or took biochemistry, you've probably been exposed to this. Um, but these are the 20 most common amino acids um, that are used to build proteins. Um, for your knowledge, knowing um, what an alanine or a valine or an isoleucine, uh, the ILE, like what they, the abbreviations are for them, um, is important. But if you also uh, take notice that what makes them different are these side chains, these R groups. And so they all have the same uh, amino group up at the top. And then their side groups, the, what's indicated in red here, is weight, what makes them uh, different from one another. So these proteins, specifically the amino acids that make up these proteins, are very responsive to changes in pH. So if you've ever worked in a lab, a lot of chemical reactions specifically with proteins are very pH sensitive and you have to ensure that the pH is within this active zone um, to make sure that the molecules are acting the way you want them to or the proteins uh, specifically and so um, here we have histidine uh, the R group of histidine and if you were to shift the pH from 5.8 to 7.8 pH shift of 2 you see that there is um, a shift in the protonation or deprotonation of these hist uh, histidine side chains. So it becomes deprotonated if your pH is too high as opposed to its uh, kind of active pH of 5.8. So pH is very important in maintaining the actual uh, function and structure of these proteins and their activity. So in addition uh, to those dehydration reactions that we saw with the release of the water, um, you can also have two adjacent uh, sulfhydryl groups that are oxidized. And when this oxidation reaction recur occurs, uh, each releases a proton and an electron. Um, and this forms a covalent disulfide bond. So here we have uh, these two side chains that will release a proton and an electron each. That forms this a disulfide bond and these are um, very common um, 
in proteins. So they cross-link proteins um, either uh, intramolecular, intramolecularly or intermolecularly. So adding some complexity to these amino acids is the fact that they can be modified either before or after synthesis into a polypeptide chain or a, a protein. So uh, these amino acid, these, this is some examples of these amino acid uh, R groups that are being modified. And so you can add acetyl groups, um, you can add a, uh, a phosphate group to make a phosphoserine out of a serine, um, or a phosphotyrosine out of a tyrosine, uh, et cetera. So these are just some examples of the modifications that can occur to amino acids. So we have 20 basic amino acids, but then they can all be modified. So you have a whole bunch of um, specificity that can happen uh, to make more and more different chemical compounds. So let's look at the structure of nucleotides uh, specific for uh, DNA and RNA. So um, both DNA and RNA have this basic uh, structure where they have a phosphate group, they have a sugar backbone, in this case this is ribose, so it would be RNA, and then they have a nucleotide attached to it. Now what differentiates DNA and RNA is that RNA is made of ribose and DNA is made of deoxyribose. So the only difference, my picture is kind of covering it here, is this uh, OH group in deoxyribose is just a hydrogen. So the nucleotides that make up DNA can be segregated into two classes. We have the purines, which are a pair of fused re, uh, rings, and this is adenine and guanine. Um, and the pyrimidines are a single ring, ring um, and that is cysteine, or sorry, cytosine, <laughs> cytosine in both uh, uh, DNA and RNA, and then thymine in DNA, this is only in DNA, and then uracil in RNA, which is only in RNA. Talk a little bit about <clears throat> sugars here. Um, so, for instance, hexose. Um, this is kind of the primary uh, power source, uh, sugar power source in the cell, specifically glucose is. Um, so, uh, D glucose uh, is uh, linear and can also have ring forms, um, and they're interconvertible by reactions of the aldehyde uh, at carbon one. Uh, so that is this group right up there. Um, and that reacts with the hydroxyl of carbon uh, four or five. So down here, so these hydroxyl groups down here. Um, and that forms the six member ring uh, pyranose, which predominates in biological systems. Now, which, what differentiates uh, D-mannose and D-galactose from D-glucose is the location uh, of the H and OHs, uh, the hydroxyl groups, uh, and where they're bound. So as you can see in uh, glucose, we have uh, the OH on C2 on the right-hand side, then three on the left, four right, five right. And in mannose, we have left, left, right, right. And in galactose, we have left, right, left, right. And so uh, these are kind of stereocarbon differences in these sugars. So this pyranose conformation that glucose forms, um, the most stable conformation is this chair-like uh, structure, as they call it. Um, and that consists um, in this conformation with the non-ring hydrogen and oxygen bonds nearly perpendicular to the ring um, or in the plane with the ring. So as you can see here, we have kind of this planar structure, um, although there's kind of these uh, inversions and, and folds in it, but the oxygen and hydrogen groups, or uh, hydroxyl and hydrogen groups are in a planar fashion. So they're not going, uh, generally not going 
up and down, but they're going kind of out in the direction of this conformation. So in addition to the monosaccharides like galactose, glucose, and fructose, we also have disaccharides that make up different sugars that you may be familiar with. So these glycosidic linkages uh, form when uh, the carbon of one sugar molecule is linked to a hydroxyl uh, oxygen in another sugar molecule. So for example, lactose, which you know from milk, um, contains a beta 1,4 uh, glycosidic bond. So between the number one carbon of the galactose and the number four carbon of the glucose. And then in terms of sucrose, which is uh, this table sugar that is made from plants like sugarcane and things like that, there's an alpha 1,2 bond um, between the number one carbon in the glucose and the two carbon in the pentose sugar fructose. Um, and so uh, this is important for in biological terms because human digestive enzymes can hydrolyze the alpha glycosidic bonds in starch, but not the uh, beta uh, glycosidic bonds in cellulose. And so, um, for example, cellulose is the sugar that makes up uh, the structure of plants, right? The cell wall of plants. And so that's something that can't be digested by humans. We call it uh, fiber, right? So you need to increase the fiber in your diet. And that is these, the cellulosic sugar that can't be digested. And that's why eating, even though there's a lot of sugar in plants in the form of cellulose, we consider it a food that is uh, not high in carbohydrates. Now, there are some animals that can easily break these beta glycosidic linkages, um, such as cows and termites and things of that nature, because they have specific celluloses in their gut that are able to break those linkages. The same thing for lactose. When you're a child um, and you're an infant, you're able to digest lactose, but as you get older, you reduce the amount of lactase that you produce, and you're not able to break down lactose into galactose and glucose, and thus that's where a lot of people have lactose intolerance because they're not able to digest it. So phosphatidylcholine is a typical phosphoglyceride, and these are what make up membranes, uh, and membranes are assembled through those non-covalent associations of the uh, amphipathic phospholipid building blocks. And so these phosphoglycerides are phospholipids with a three carbon glycerol. So that is those three uh, right in the middle there. Um, and this is kind of the back, uh, backbone of the molecule and it contains a hydrophobic tail. So here we have uh, this long carbon chain that is hydrophobic because it does not want to form those polar bonds with water. Um, and it, these bonds are formed through uh, an esterification reaction of two of its uh, hydroxyl groups, OH groups, two fatty acids, um, and to a uh, hydrophilic head, which is the blue part here, so the choline in this uh, example. Um, and so the carbon-carbon uh, bond rotation in this uh, backbone here, so where those carbons are bound to each other, um, it, that is responsible for orienting the hydrophobic tails in one direction and the hydrophilic heads in the other direction, thus making this molecule that is uh, polar on one side and then nonpolar or hydrophobic on the other side. Now let's compare, compare this to uh, triacylglycerol. So in the previous example, we had our glycerol group that was formed this ester bond to two fatty acid chains that were nonpolar, but the third bond was attached to a polar head group, uh, the choline in that example. Now that allowed it to be polar on one side and nonpolar on the other, thus it was able to form those bilipid, or those uh, phospholipid bilayers. However, in the example of triacylglycerol, triacylglycerol is attached to three of these uh, nonpolar um, chains, right? And or fatty acid chains. And so 
because of that, there's no polar head group, and thus there's no way for triacylglycerol uh, to form this bilayer, and it's not suitable for forming uh, these uh, phospholipid membranes. Instead, it's very uh, um, nonpolar, and it doesn't um, have any way to react with uh, water, and it doesn't go into solution at all. So the fatty acids that are uh, incorporated into phospholipids um, are, there's a couple different types. So there's saturated and unsaturated fatty acids. Unsaturated fatty acids are fatty acids that have double bonds within them. Um, and they are uh, kind of more kinked chains, while saturated fatty acids have no uh, double bonds in them. Um, and it allows them to uh, kind of more tightly packed together. So on top of that, with these uh, uh, fatty acids that are double bound, um, unsaturated, we have two configurations. We have the cis and the trans configuration. Um, and the difference is that cis means that the hydrogen bonds are on the same side of the double bond. And in trans, the hydrogen bonds are on opposite sides of the double bond. And so for the cis configuration, um, this introduces a rigid kink uh, in the otherwise flexible straight acyl chain of the saturated fatty acid. Um, and that prevents tight packing into a membrane layer because it's not, they can't all just stack on top of each other. You have these kinked shapes, right? Um, but in trans, there is less of this rigid kink and they are able to form these dense layers. And so, um, cis fatty acids at room temperature are generally liquids and so are oils for that matter. Um, so when you hear about good fats like using olive oil or canola oil or things of that nature, these are cis uh, fatty, uh, unsaturated fatty acids. Trans uh, fats, you probably heard, avoid trans fats. Trans, fa trans fats are bad. Trans fats are not really naturally occurring and generally come up in processed food and they've been linked to heart disease and at room temperature they're solid um, so um, things like uh, in potato chips uh, like kind of the greasy uh, fats in the potato chips or in butters and things or, or artificial butter margarines and things like that have a lot of trans fats um, and like I said, these have been linked to heart disease. And generally, um, the thought is that the, they're able to form these bound solid layers and cholesterol and things like that within your arteries, um, whereas cis fatty acids uh, don't correlate uh, with that phenomenon. So cholesterol is a compound found within your body that generally think, oh, cholesterol is bad, and then, oh, there's good cholesterol and bad cholesterol, yada, yada, yada. Well, cholesterol is essential for um, uh, the formation of steroids and things like that that are important for your body, not like baseball steroids like Arnold Schwarzenegger, I'm going to pump you up steroids, but you need steroids within your body um, as natural amounts of these molecules. Um, but uh, cholesterol can turn into an ester, um, and that's translate, uh, transported in these LDL, uh, low-density uh, lipids. Um, and these are the bad cholesterols that are transferred in your bloodstream. Uh, and that, an example of that is down here, where you can see this fatty acid chain has been attached um, through or to this cholesterol molecule. So I kind of buried the lead and got ahead of myself a little bit in that previous slide. Um, and so the effect of a double bond uh, bond within the fatty acid affects the shape of the fatty acid, and here's an example. Um, so we have palmitic acid, um, which is a saturated fatty acid with 16 carbon atoms. Um, as you can see, it forms this very straight linear structure uh, because there is no double bond. And then in this case, we have um, oleic acid, um, which is an 18 carbon uh, uh, fatty acid. And um, the cis conformation of it creates this rigid kink um, in the, oops, I kind of went a little far ahead of my arrow, <laughs> this rigid kink um, that causes it to not be linear. 
Um, but a trans double bond would make it much more linear. So cis is good because, as you can see, if you were to try to stack these, it's much more difficult than if we had more of these uh, palmitate uh, fatty acids or trans oleic acids where we could just stack them like that. And thus, oleic acid in this cis form is a liquid at room temperature, while uh, palmitate or trans uh, oleate is in a uh, solid form at room temperature. So when we look at chemical reactions, uh, we have this constant, or this KEQ, and that is a chemical reaction where the product reactant ratio in the forward and in the reverse direction are equal. Um, however, cell linked reactions are in a steady state and are not at equilibrium. Um, this dissociation constant, KD, is a measure of non-covalent interactions, um, and uh, one thing to also consider, we talked about it kind of previously uh, with the proteins, um, is the pH uh, in these systems, which obviously affects uh, the rate of reactions as to um, the amount of protons available, etc. Um, the pH in the cytoplasm is about 7.2 to 7.4, so it's very close to neutral, but it can be lower in some organelles. Uh, the example here being the lysosome, where the pH is low at uh, 4.5. Um, and so acids obviously release protons and bases bind up protons. Um, and biological systems use these weak acid base buffers to maintain pH in a narrow range. And obviously, the reason for that is because that narrow range has to be maintained so proteins in these chemical reactions function at their desired rates um, and are not lowered because of this lowered or, or raised pH. So if we were to look at this reaction rate uh, versus time, we can see that we start with uh, these, uh, the product of uh, this forward reaction and the product of this re reverse reaction. Um, and as the rate of the reverse reaction increases, um, it increases as the concentration of the product increases. So as we're making more end product from the forward reaction, uh, the rate of the reverse reaction increases to convert back to the original uh, molecules. And as the rate of the forward reaction, uh, uh, it'll decrease as the concentrations of the reactants or our initial products decrease. So if there's less things to turn in to a forward or into a final product from a reaction, the rate slows down because there's not enough raw materials really uh, to continue at that rate. And eventually we'll reach this chemical equilibrium where the rate of forward reactions, so turning product, uh, the starting products into an end product, and the reverse reaction, the reaction of turning the end product back into its initial um, raw materials is equal. So as we see here, um, we have a test tube of equilibrium concentrations where product AAA is turned into three products of BBD, and this reaction is fully uh, equal in that the rate of the forward and the rate of the reverse are the same. But as I said earlier, inside cells, this isn't always the case, and in generally is not the case. And so in a steady state pathway like we find in a cell, uh, product B is made from product A, so we have two A's uh, turning into three B's, um, but then it is further converted to uh, C, so a third component. So it's moving along this pathway. And thus, there's not enough Bs to form an equilibrium with A. There'll be more A's, so they'll continue to be formed into B. And the same thing with C, where there's going to be uh, less Cs than Bs. And so the rate of back and forth is not held constant, and thus, uh, this equilibrium state is generally not observed. So when we talk about uh, proteins, and specifically in this case, uh, multi-ligand uh, mar uh, macromolecules, that's a mouthful, uh, these multi-ligand macromolecules can bind multiple ligands. And so um, if you remember in genetics, you have uh, transcription factors that will bind multiple other proteins to allow for transcription to occur. 
um, or uh, uh, repressors or activators will bind to ligand and then they'll bind to either transcription factors or the DNA directly. And so in this case here, we have a uh, macromolecule that binds three specific ligands. It binds a small protein, which may be an activator or a conformational change protein. Uh, we have ligand B, which binds to a small molecule. Um, this could be a sugar. Uh, actually, it can't be a sugar because ligand C is an example of sugar. Uh, so it could be a small molecule, um, some sort of sensory molecule uh, that is present in the cell, insulin, or, or something of that nature. Um, and then it has ligand C that binds to a sugar in this example. And so one macromolecule can have multiple different uh, binding partners to have uh, function within the cell. So we talked about how pH can affect these uh, um, molecular reactions. Um, and so this is just kind of a, to give you an idea of pH of some solutions. You probably have been exposed to this before. Um, a lower pH has lower uh, hydrogen ion uh, concentration or less protonated. Um, and so we have pH 14, which is uh, one normal uh, sodium hydroxide. And then uh, bleach that you have in your house is about 12. Uh, Seawater is between 9 and 10. And then kind of our biological uh, inside the cell, uh, we have a fertilized egg, the interior cell, and an unfertilized egg is all right around 7. Um, but as we talked about earlier, uh, some organelles have different pHs inside them. So a lysosome's pH is uh, around four. Um, and then gastric juice, uh, so the inside of your stomach, because it needs to hydrolyze different things and break down um, food, proteins, uh, carbohydrates, fats, etc., that has a very low pH of one, so it's very acidic. a little bit here about the measure uh, biochemical energetics and the measure of energy transfer within a cell. So delta G measures the reaction change in free energy. So negative delta G are thermodynamically favorable, where a positive delta G reaction is not. So um, it is much more difficult and doesn't happen naturally. It needs help. Uh, so free energy change, delta G is zero. Um, is calculated from reactants products at equilibrium. So it's when the, we've reached a steady state of the reaction. The rate of the reaction depends on the, acti the activation energy and catalysts uh, can generally lower this activation energy to get the activation or the, uh, the molecular reaction started. Um, negative delta G uh, reactions such as ATP hydrolysis so turning ATP into ADP and PI and energy can drive coupled uh, positive delta G reactions. So those thermodynamically unfavorable positive delta G reactions can be driven by the hydrolysis of ATP. So ATP stores energy and releases it to make those unfavorable positive delta G reactions uh, actually work. Uh, so sunlight energy is the ultimate store of all cell energy. So um, plants take energy from the sun, store it as uh, carbohydrates or any other sort of proteins, molecular um, uh, holders of energy through these bonds. And then we have uh, the energy is passed down through the food, or up, I should say, through the food chain to uh, other animals who then use it. So. Um, the ones that are creating energy are the plants, and then all other animals in some way uh, through the food chain rely on those plants to get that energy. And then there are coenzymes such as NAD plus, FAD, um, where oxidation and reduction uh, tr uh, is a, the electron transport chain. Uh, it transfers stores uh, of the, this energy throughout the cell. Let's look at exergonic and endergonic reactions. So there are two principal forms of energy in biology. There's the kinetic energy, uh, which is thermal, radiant, mechanical, electrical, and then there is potential energy, which is stored energy. And yet this energy in a biological context is generally stored in chemical bonds, um, as well as in electrochemical gradients um, that we'll discuss uh, later on in this course. Um, 
And cells can transform all types of energy into another. You can transform kinetic energy into potential or potential into kinetic. And this energy, when we talk about uh, within the cell, we talk about calories, um, which is the amount of energy required to raise uh, one cubic milliliter of water one degree. And so in an exergonic reaction, which is spontaneous, the free energy of the products is less than that of the reactant and energy is released. So we have our reactants um, and then a reaction occurs and it makes products that are easier to make plus some free, some energy is produced. Um, so the, an example of this would be breaking down ATP into ADP. Now an energonic reaction is one of those reactions that we have a positive uh, delta G and this is a reaction that's not favorable and it wouldn't uh, proceed spontaneously. And thus, the free energy this produces is greater than that of the reactants required, uh, of the reactants. And thus, there has to be an external energy source to do this. Um, and so creating of proteins and things of that nature where it requires energy input, which is generally produced from ATP, those are what fuel this reaction, uh, which is unfavorable thermodynamically. So as stated earlier, a catalyst can lower the activation energy of a reaction. So for this reaction to proceed, it takes, uh, we have our free reactants that are just naturally occurring, um, but to convert from one reactant to a product, you need to have an input energy that allows the uh, to reach this transition state that allows the reaction to take off on its own. And the catalyst, that lowers this activation energy, so there's a lot less input of energy required to proceed with this reaction. 